conversation. Uh, <laughs> Priya Ray here. Uh, she is going to be facilitating our conversation. And uh, for those who are new, um, so Vic, Alana, um, what I so I started Crip Chat as a way to respond to quarantine. Honestly, it was like a download I received. And I'm like, oh, do this. And I'm like, okay, I don't know what it's supposed to look like. I don't know how to do this, but I felt a calling to do to put together a Zoom call where people with disabilities can come to talk, talk with each other, um, just re have real talk and, and be honest and transparent with each other about our shared experiences. We have, you know, but we don't just limit it to people with disabilities. We have people without disabilities um, because, you know, we, you know, our allies and our advocates, they're all very important. Uh, and so it has turned into something really beautiful we have not everyone shows up to every call and I don't know if they just watch the replays on YouTube, but we have about over 130 people now on this list for Crip Chat. Oh my gosh. I know. <laughs> That's awesome. It is. It's pretty amazing. And wow. so, oh, we got Chris coming in. Um, and so I, but I felt like, you know what, this isn't about me. This isn't, this is our community. And we, I started inviting people who um, was part of this community. If they wanted to talk about a particular topic and lead that discussion, I love bringing up leaders. Um, and so if anyone else feels called to um, talk about a particular topic that's on your heart and you'd like to step into that role, we'd love to have you. So I'm going to put out that call to action for anyone that wants it. So I am, it is a five past. We go to, a, for about an hour and a half, we'll go to about 1230 today, my time. Sorry guys, I'm in Hawaii. Um, mm -hmm. And if anyone wants to put in the chat for, cause we do have some new people, Chris, welcome back. So nice excited to, you, to <laughs> um, maybe you can put in the chat where you're from so we can kind of get an idea, like disabled people, like we're everywhere. Our allies and yeah. advocates are everywhere. So I love that. So if you can and feel called, please put your in the chat where you're from. Um, all right. So I'm going to hand this over to Priya Ray, which, by the way, her birthday was the other day. So yeah. we can maybe. Fun. Yes. She had a little call. I just I was like, what do I do? Pandemic. I'm just going to have a Zoom party. <laughs> <laughs> and she did. And we all sang happy uh -huh. birthday to her. Funny, I wish I had been recorded because everybody was singing, but nobody was on like together. So it was, everybody was singing at their own. It was so funny. I was like, oh, this is funny. Yeah. I wish I had. Uh -huh. Oh, well. <laughs> Tell the story to people in the future. That's all. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, okay. So, oh, we got some other people coming in. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and hand this off to Priya Ray. All I, uh, what I'm going to ask is that if you're not talking, if you want to put yourself on mute, uh, that way we can avoid having any crossover. And what happens is when one person talks over another, it cancels the noise out. So then nothing happens. We can't hear anybody. So um, if we can just be mindful of that, that would be great. And I'm going to let Priya Ray take it, take over now. I'll put myself on mute. Okay, cool. Hi, guys. Okay, I'm Priya. Um, I actually have a grassroots group called DIY Able. So, I, you know, I... Before I even joined this group, I was already kind of doing advocacy. But I'm so... Um, grateful to have been part of this group because I've made some of uh, some really good friends through it that couldn't show up today. Tylea, who if for the newcomers, Tylea is another really uh, great advocate, but her grandmother's visiting. So she's like, I can't go Priya, my grandmother's visiting. So it's like, that's okay. So um, I do a grassroots group. So I thought talking about medical, like the medical industry and the issues we have Disabled people with it. Um, I'm going to start with the story. It's not really medical issue, but the, the way the doctor acted. So basically, I, ha I moved 
I, I moved all over the country after I had a spinal cord injury in 1999. I have a T12L1 spinal cord injury. And I, after I had my injury, I kind of, I moved all over the country. I lived, I was living in Pennsylvania with my parents and then I moved to LA, I moved to the Bay Area and then I ended up, fine, my final destination was Asheville. And um, in those, all those places I lived, finding a doctor was really like, it was like, um, I don't know. In LA, I was really lucky. I just looked up a doctor in the phone book and just called them. And they, they were like, and, and she just happened to be really great. She was a great doctor. And so I just was like, okay. But I mean, I did have one experience, like I had a urinary tract infection and they, they didn't really send the culture and they kept giving me antibiotics. So then I finally had to call the doctor and like, hey, it's like, I, this isn't going away. I don't want to keep taking antibiotics. Can you figure this out? And they're like, okay, we're really sorry. Let's get the culture before we change up the antibiotics or give you new ones. So I was like, okay. So then I moved to the Bay Area and I had to switch my doctor like five times there because the doctors, because what happened was I had a spinal cord injury. Two years went by and then I started getting sensations in my body and it just increasingly got worse and it's ended up being spasticity and neuropathy which are side effects of a spinal cord injury and other disabilities as well by the way and so um i uh i when i started getting this i started going to the doctors and they were just like oh we think you have irritable bowel syndrome we think you have this we think you have that so i call it going through the the hamster wheel, you know, when the hamsters are run, like the hamster wheel of the medical world, because they're like this, that, this, and blah, 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 blah. And then I went to see a neurologist, and the neurologist was like, oh, you have robust bone growth where your injury was. Maybe we should take those rods out. Maybe that's what's causing your pain. I was like, no, I'm not going to get an operation. And then like, you know, it didn't help. And then I go through an operation and then I'm in bed because I got to recover from this operation. It was something I wasn't really ready to jump into. And so then I moved to Asheville and I joined, I, I got, I got this practice that was pretty good. I actually liked the practice a lot because they're really efficient with your medication and the staff was really good. So I actually liked the practice, but my doctor, I didn't really get along with her and I, I don't know, we just didn't have a good chemistry. And uh, my pain was like getting bad around the time of my period, it got worse. So I was like telling that and she like kind of gave me birth control, like pills at first. And I was like, no, that's not working. Then she gave me something called a depot shot, which I, by the way, will tell everyone here, do not ever get that because it is horrible. And it made me go, and it's a shot and they give you, and you don't really have to take birth control for I think a year after they give it. And it, it made me insane for a year, basically. <laughs> That's what that shot did to me. Did not help my pain and made me insane for a year. And by the way, I feel really bad for my partner, Robert, who is literally my caregiver, but I was really mean to him. And then I would apologize. I'm like, I'm really sorry. It's the shot. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But he was, luckily, I'm very fortunate to have a very understanding partner. So he was just like, it's okay. I understand. But I was like, sorry. Then the next day, it would have start all over again. So, you know, but even then, I still wasn't... Um, I don't know. I don't think she really liked me because I'm very sarcastic. I do, when, you know, when instead of anger, I deal with things in a sarcastic way. So I was like, I told her, I was like, do you really give that shot to people? Like, how could, how does anyone even survive that? Like, it's, I told her it drove me crazy. Then she told me something. It's like, oh, I think it works better for teenagers <laughs> or something. And she told me that I was like, all right, I don't think that's the truth, but I'm not going to question you on that. So this was like the last straw for me. So I, I, I got my driver's license here in North Carolina and there's actually a facility here called Care Partners that, you know, took, I mean, I already knew how to drive, but I don't know, North Carolina is like, you gotta take the test again. So I don't know, I just wanted to go to this facility and they gave me some driving lessons and 
you know, had took me to the DMV. I took the driver's test. So in order, and I passed. And so in order to get my license, the state of North Carolina is like, you need to get your doctor to fill this form out, which I felt was reasonable actually, because it, it, you know, cause we all know disabilities are all different and, you know, some people have seizures and things like that. So they just want to make sure, you know, that, you know, your disability wasn't going to impede upon your driving ability. And they just kind of wanted to know what your deal was. And so I felt that was a reasonable request. And my doctor filled it out and ma mailed it to the DMV. And then a year later, the DMV is like, oh, you, you know, your license is suspended because we never got the, the new evaluation of your health. And so I was like, what? I was like, that's weird. I have a spinal cord injury, you know, and spinal cord injury, uh, you know, some disabilities are more, you know, over time it gets worse, but a spinal cord injury, you pretty much have it and you know, your body ages. So you have to deal with that kind of stuff, but you know, it doesn't really get worse or better your ability. So I just was confused. I called the DMV and they looked it up and they're like, oh, your doctor said you have to get it checked out. You have to get checked out every year. And I was like, what? Oh my God. So that really made me angry because I felt that was very ableist in her. You know, she's a doctor and she should know that as a patient with a spinal cord injury that I don't really need to get up checked up every year to drive. And I felt like that was something she should have known as a doctor. So I called the practice because I really like the practice. So I didn't want to change the practice. And there's like six doctors in this practice. So I, so Sometimes when the doctor's not there, you go see another doctor in the practice. And there was this other doctor that I really liked. And she was like, I don't know. I just really got along with her. Our chemistry was better. So I told them, I was like, I want to switch to that doctor. And I told them what happened. I told the nurse. And the nurses all love me. They're like, Priya, hey, what's up? How are you doing? I'm like, I'm good. How are you? So I told the nurse, I was like, listen, this doctor, this is what she did. She, she filled it out and said, I needed to get checked out every year. I was like, I feel this is really ableist. I feel that's against my rights as a disabled person that she wouldn't know like that I don't need to get checked out every year. I was like, and our chemistry isn't good anyway. So I just want to switch doctors. I want to switch to this other doctor. And they were like, I could tell they're there. And they agreed with the nurse. Agreed. She goes, Oh yeah, you're right. But I could see her turn going from like, Hey, Priya, what's up to like, Oh no. Okay. Like, like, Oh gosh. Okay. So she's like, well, I understand what you want to do with that. So let's, um, I just have to, you know, as a professional courtesy, I have to just okay it with the two doctors from the practice. And so I'll let you know, you know, what they say. So of course they were like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. So now I see this other doctor, which she's great because I, you know, like I had a, I don't know, my, my nerve pain kind of increased in the last couple of weeks. So I wanted to check if I had a urinary tract infection, which is what a UTI is. I think I said UTI before, but UTI stands for urinary tract infection for those that don't know. So, uh, so like when your pain increases like that, you got to kind of go through this checklist. Is it this? Is it that? So urinary tract infection is the first thing. And so I told them, I was like, I don't think I have one. It doesn't totally feel like it, but my nerve pain is bad. So I just want to make sure I can cross that off the list of what's going on. And so they're like, I was like, but I'm in a lot of pain and I have the cups here. Do I have to, do I have to come in to give the urine sample? I just don't want to come in. And they're like, let me ask your doctor if it's okay. Um, and then they call back and she said, yeah, she said it was fine. Just have your partner drop off the urine sample. So, you know, he did. And then I had a video conference, which was, I don't know, I was excited because I've only read about this happening. So it was like kind of cool. I was like, oh yeah, I'm being part of history. I'm getting this video conference here, which I wish I had taken a screenshot, but I didn't. But anyway, I talked to the doctor and I, I explained exactly how I'd explained to you. I was like, yeah, I don't think I have a urinary tract infection, but you know, it's like, I just kind of got to do this checklist of things to make sure it's not that before I just decide, okay, my pain's bad for some reason. Like I just got to deal with it and continue on with my life. So, um, 
she said, okay. She goes, well, I did this dip thing and I don't know, there's, I didn't really see anything, but maybe there's, there's some stuff that could maybe conclude it's a urinary tract infection, but we have to get a culture to make sure for sure. So I said, she's like, do you want me to give you antibiotics in between? And I was like, no, if it's going to be two days, I'll just wait. I'm not really having all the other symptoms, which is more spasticity of the urine. So it just comes out more often and all these other things, you know, inconveniences of life that happen when you have a, you know, loss of bladder control during, during a UTI. So I just said, no, I'll just wait. I, I've been taking this stuff, d manos just like kind of a natural prevention for urinary tract infection. I don't think it really fights it, but I was like, I've been taking that. So I'll just continue to take that. So she's like, okay, yeah, that sounds reasonable. And we'll let you know. And Friday I didn't have a urinary tract infection. So, you know, so then all the other things were, so the eye pain is just bad for no reason apparent to anyone else in the world, including myself. And I have to just deal with it. So that's what I'm doing. So that is my experience, like with the medical industry, essentially, I talked really fast because, you know, I want to give other people time to talk about stuff they've dealt with. And so, yeah, so I, you know, I'd like to pose, Tylea, yay! Grandma's let you come to the meeting, yay! Um, so She's outside I, drinking wine right now. Well, Grandma's like, go to your meeting, I'm drinking wine <laughs> by the pool. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I just wanted other people to talk about things they've dealt with. I know Tylea also has, she's on, oh, I'm ready for this meeting. I got so much to say. I was like, okay. So, you know, and I feel like we've all had these kinds of issues. So I would welcome for people to share. And I don't know how we should do it, whether we should go roll call. Well, Tylea, oh, you're going to raise your hand. But yeah, we'll just let Tylea. Yeah, real quick in the chat, um, real quick. Um, yeah. Things there were a couple mind. questions in the chat. Uh, oh, yeah. You wanna, uh, can you see them or do you need me to read them to you? No, can you read it to me? My, I don't, my, this age where my, you know, the glass. Sure, no worries. No worries. I can do that. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I, and I just want to take a, a, just a beat real quick and welcome. Um, is it Ohi? O, 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 G, O, H I? Oh, probably. She's going to be. O, G. OG. 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 I love it. <laughs> it's short for my very long Native American name. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Well, welcome. I also like to welcome Diana. It looks like you got frozen and I know you're having some technical issues, but I want to, um, uh, I would love to, well, we can't Facebook, well, this isn't on Facebook, so that's why we can't Facebook you in, Diana. Um, I did put in the chat, Diana, if you're having trouble with sound, I know sometimes my son will put my phone on Bluetooth and it'll stop me from, I can be like, why can't I hear anything on my phone? And I have to turn the Bluetooth off. So okay. maybe try that or if you can, cause I don't want you to not be here, um, hop on another device. Um, but I also want to do a quick shout out to Crystal, Crystal P. Thank you for coming. Um, Crystal, that's my friend, Crystal. Crystal, I, I can't see her, let me see. I'm here. Oh, I recognize you from Priya's party. Yay. I'm so happy to Crystal have you. Is, she's an interpreter for the deaf, deaf and hard hearing. Oh my gosh. That is amazing. I have one of those <laughs> friends too. Okay, cool. I'm going to keep that in the back of my head. <laughs> we'll see what we can do. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a part of a lot of medical appointments. So I witness a lot of things, you know, at work. Um, I'd love to hear your perspective in this conversation as well, but okay. um, yeah, let's definitely get to that. And then I just want to give a quick shout out to um, Freddie. Um, welcome back. And Tylea. I'm glad you were able to make it while grandma's sipping on her wine. Um, but okay. So to the questions, um, is, are UTIs uh, common with spinal cord injuries, Priya? Um, yeah, they are, but it depends. Like I am very fortunate because a lot of people with spinal cord injuries have to use a catheter and that's what really leads to this to the UTIs. I was really I did have to use a catheter when I first had my injury, but then like about 
I don't know, eight months after I had my injury, it was just like coming out unwanted as well. But at least it's coming out of my, like I, because that's like a problem with spinal cord injury. People, um, if they're not catheterizing themselves enough, then, you know, the urine's in their body and it can lead to kidney disease and stuff like that. Um, for me, my bladder can, my pee just comes out of my body all the time, which I complain about, but actually I'm actually happy about that because I know it's coming out of my body and I don't have to worry about kidney problems and stuff like that. But yeah, it is a common thing amongst spinal cord injury um, because of the catheter use. Mm. And the question was, you left us hanging. Was there a diagnosis or solution to your current issue? Oh, to, to the, I didn't have a urinary tract infection and there is no solution to my neuropathy and spasticity. It's just a nerve damage issue and other people with spina bifida and cerebral palsy as well deal with those issues. So it's like a nerve related thing. And mm. when your nerves are damaged, it causes muscles to tighten or tighten and loosen and neuropathy, which is kind of like a burning type sensation that goes through your body. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think the best way, um, because we have so many people is to maybe just do a roll call. And if anyone wants to uh, respond to your question, if, if to share their experiences, and you can just call people by name, if you don't have anything to add, just say pass, it's no big deal. Um, so I'll let you I'll let you uh, lead that. Okay, well, I'm just gonna go by what's on my screen. Um, should I go down or up I, or to the side? Well, Pauline, you'd be, you're right next to me on my screen. So you go first, Pauline. Okay. You know, I've been very blessed. I haven't had too much ableism experience in the medical industry. Um, I did have one time I brought my son in for his, we would move to Hawaii and I was, uh, had to get a pediatrician and I brought him in for the first time. And the doctor said, you gave birth to him? And I said, yeah. And he's like, and he said, and he turned out normal. And I was just like, uh, yeah, as far as I can tell, he's normal. So I feel like that was probably the most blaring example I've ever had um, of, with the medical industry in terms of ableism. Uh, and yeah, we stopped going to him after that. Uh, but yeah, I, th I feel like other than that, I, kn I know for me, um, and maybe it's just I'm, I, I just never, maybe it happens and to me, but I just didn't, I don't have like, a, I'm not conscious of it um, because I maybe just everybody's ableist. So I just, it's all, oh, that's just them being them. But it, you know, the problem, the, probably the hardest part for me is when I have to go in to get an IV or a blood test because I don't have arms. Um, and that is always a big challenge um, to have to figure out. Uh, so, um, but they eventually figured out, it's usually through my neck, um, if the veins in my, in my uh, foot, I have one little foot, I have little tiny veins and they use little butterfly ones they, they, to get blood, whatever they use for babies, that's what they use on me. Um, but for IVs, primarily in my, in my neck. So, um, not a fun experience. Doctors, I try to avoid the doctors like, like the coronavirus, but, <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I feel like I'm, I'm, I haven't, I don't have too many horror stories, so I feel blessed. Yeah, that's really great. Uh, Pauline, I'm glad you haven't had that much experience, but that was still rude of the doctor to, um, <laughs> like, be like, oh, and your son turned out normal. I feel like that's like, like the doctor should know that you could have a son and he would turn out normal. So I wanted to I, say, no, this is a stunt kid. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. I would have said to the doctor that this is a stunt baby. <laughs> I didn't actually have this baby. I just said, you know, just rented him. Yeah. yeah <laughs> but dummy. <laughs> you can't be a mom, look like a mom and just rent a baby, I guess. <laughs> It's like, no, I just picked this kid up off the street. He's got mine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right for me, Doc. Yeah. Yes. But it, it's that assumption that, oh, if you have a baby, 
then they must it's genetic that you they will inherit your disability and you know but there's so much evidence people without disabilities having babies with disabilities so it goes both ways it, it doesn't way as well so yeah and i would think from a doctor who's medically trained in science <laughs> that, that that would translate <laughs> Okay, well, I guess next up is Paul. Uh, Paul, do you have anything you'd like to share? I know I saw you in the chat. You're like, you responded to Pauline. So please let us know. You can write too if you want to do it in the chat, if that's easier, whatever's the best for you. How about, well, Paul is, is writing it in the chat. We can, um, we'll go and get, when his pops up. Um, yeah, go I, to Iman next. I'm just gonna go with that. Is that okay, Paul? Is that okay? Yes, okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Imani, go ahead and share your... I never really had um, issues with the doctor, thank God. <laughs> but my mm -hmm. mom was a big, my mom, and she still is, she's a big advocate on uh, to make sure that I'm being treated the right way. So, uh, but luckily I haven't had any issues. Well, that's good. I'm really glad to hear that. And yay for your mom, making sure you're getting, <laughs> doctors are doing right by you. So um, I guess, um, uh, Vic, you're next in line in my, roster of zoom so uh when i was about seven years old i couldn't walk anymore like my knees would like walk up couldn't walk if i was trying to run like i literally was trying to run like i was a chair like my knees would still be bent at like 90 degree angles i couldn't like get off the floor and whatnot and my mom you know took me to the pediatrician we went through the whole process like why is my kid doing weird things like all of a sudden like my mobility just went horribly bad all of a sudden and I went through three doctors who told me the first one said oh it's just growth her growth plates are messed up like she'll grow out of this and they refused to do like any testing ran no blood work took no x-rays just touched my knees and went oh you're you'll grow out of it uh I didn't went to so my mom went to took me to another doctor who basically told me that I just needed to eat healthier and that would somehow help me like be able to walk normally again. Um, and then a third doctor was like, oh, she just needs to go to physical therapy. We're not, they still like, none of these three doctors like ran any tests or anything. Um, and my mom was like, you know what, I'm done. And took me to a fourth doctor who actually like asked about uh, my family history with anything like this. And I have a cousin who had got arthritis when she was like two years old and she is in a wheelchair has never been able to walk since. And my doctor went, hey, we're gonna test you for that then. And it turned out like I tested ANA positive, have arthritis, but it took three doctors to even just get to the testing and whatnot. And then even with that, my I got my first rheumatologist who was super nervous about like putting me on medication because I was seven years old. There's not a whole lot of studies on the longitudinal effects of the medication. And they're like, we could give you meds. They might mess you up the rest of your life, but like, at least you'll be able to walk. And <laughs> like shortly thereafter, like I got on my first round of medications. I had two knee surgeries, um, like three months apart because the first one, they pulled out all of the fluid that was in my knees and then um, injected steroids. And that somehow didn't work. So I then had to go back and do it again. Um, I was in second grade at the time and I missed over 50% of my education that year with a school system that was like, hey, either pull out of public school permanently or show up to class. So right. as I was going through that kind of, you know, like, couldn't, didn't know what was wrong with me, was in constant pain. Like I was terrified to go to school. I was literally like nervous to do anything because I didn't know if I could like get up off the ground. I had trouble like getting on and off the bus in the morning. Like my mom used to have to drive me to school every morning just so I would be able to like physically get to school. 
Um, and then I had from after I got that diagnosis, got on medication and whatnot, they I would through like I think like six to seven years of physical and occupational therapy just to be able to get like full movement of my hands and my legs as well. Um, but as I've gotten older, I didn't have a lot, like I had a lot of ableism right at the beginning, not a whole lot in the middle, but now I've come to learn that uh, none of my doctors tested me for lupus, even though it's really comorbid with arthritis. And mm -hmm. it turns out I also have lupus and I've been having symptoms of that my entire life um, that we've been thinking were actually arthritis symptoms, but arthritis doesn't cause like casual rashes to appear on your body and like doesn't cause, you know, a whole lot of fatigue and a lot of issues that we didn't know. And I'm in the process right now of trying to even get a lupus diagnosis, let alone get on medication for it. And my rheumatologist keeps telling me, oh, no, it, it's not lupus. Like, you're just having an arthritis flare. There's nothing to be worried about. And I'm like, um, arthritis doesn't cause some of these things. Like, as I'm looking at, you know, the National Lupus Organization's symptom list, like, she won't even, like, test me for it at all. Because she's like, we're just going to, you know, see that you're ANA positive and that you have an RA factor. So it's just arthritis. And like, I had a really bad flare, like literally two weeks ago when I called her and she's like, oh, that, that's nothing to be concerned about. Like, just go to the hospital. They'll give you some medication and send you home. And I was like, um, no, no, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> that, that's not a thing. And the hospital system that I live in, live around right now, every time I've gone, I've gone for, like, I accidentally broke my ankle one time and I went and they're like reading my medical history and I was like yeah I have arthritis and they're like no you don't you're too young for that and I was like no um I've had it since I was seven but like <laughs> cool congrats thanks thanks for your opinion and I had um a couple doctors tell like out in our hospital in Tiffin here tell me that like they can't give me certain medication because it'll interact with my arthritis but also will then tell me, hey, you don't actually have arthritis, so we can give you this medication. And I'm like, how does that make sense? But um, I've been, I then also recent, like, we, so the end of my senior year of college, I ended up getting what is now like brain damage, just kind of out of the blue. It originally started as like a really bad migraine that like never went away. And it turns out that actually what happened is in my left frontal temporal lobe, um, which your temporal lobe controls your auditory processing and your left temporal lobe controls face recognition. And then your prefrontal cortex does like executive functioning. A lot of your um, <laughs> like higher level processing things happen in that lobe. So like that's permanently swollen, like right on this part of my brain. So it affects like my memory really bad, like especially when I'm in flares. I have like speech impediments from it, like auditory processing issues and whatnot. And when I, I've been in this diagnosis process for a year and a half and my current neurologist like originally didn't want to do anything about it. She was like, oh, it's just a migraine. Like it is just a really bad migraine. I had it, it just kind of happened one day, had a place that had a really bad migraine, didn't think anything of it, went to the hospital to get it broken. And they literally just sent me home, even though I had no recollection of the past four days when I actually went to the hospital. I couldn't talk. I had no idea where I was. I had no idea what was going on. I had barely eaten anything because I couldn't physically like lift my arms to like put food in my mouth. My roommate had actually been like spoon feeding me food from the cafeteria and like letting me, dr she would like fill a bottle of Gatorade up and put the straw in my mouth and be like, just drink it. So like it was definitely not a normal migraine and they mm. gave me the IV to like, you know, break it. And that's when I kind of came to and I was like, this is a hospital. Oops. <laughs> How did I get here? Well, this is not good. And I was like, can y'all like check that out real quick? Because I don't think something's right. They told me it was a tension headache and sent me home after all that. Oh and my God. Yeah, while also telling me that, like, you should probably call your doctor. So I did, and she's like, it's probably just a tension headache. And <laughs> then I came home again to get it tested, did, the, did one of the memory tests, and completely failed it. Like, I was probably in, like, the 25 percentile of, like, scores. I just did horrible on it. And they're like, yeah, maybe something's wrong. 
did all the testing, you know, no brain tumor, you didn't have a stroke, nothing like major, but they still don't know like what it is. And my doctor's not exactly like keen on doing a whole bunch of medical tests because she's like, well, your medication controls it. So why do we need to look into the further causes? Like, you know, some of your triggers, you know, you know what not to be around, you know what not to do. So like, we're not going to look into it. Here's medication. Call me if anything changes. And like, <laughs> I've asked both my rheumatologist and my neurologist, like, could that be lupus? Because I know lupus can affect your brain. And they're like, no, we don't think you have lupus, even though all your tests say you likely do. So, yeah. Oh, that's, God, that's <laughs> frustrating, but I yeah. feel like that's like 10 million times worse than anything I've had to do. And you are such a positive person. So I it's just such a fact. I <laughs> uh, but yeah, what a nightmare. And I, I want Paul to be able to talk, but yeah, I, I talk about later is doctors like, they don't seem to want to diagnose things. They're just like, it just seems like they want to do like, you know, almost like a factory, like this is what's yeah. going on. Okay, you're, we're done with you. Get out the door for the next one. So, And I know some like insurance companies won't even cover some of the testing. Like you have to fight to get your insurance to approve yeah. it. And some insurance says you have to show so much cause for it. And like, once you get on medication that controls whatever is going on so often, the insurance companies go, oh, well, it's controlled now, so we're not going to approve any testing just to figure out, you know, what caused it and get the actual diagnosis. Yeah, and I think for me also a lot of the medications that I've been given, insurance won't pay for it. So the doctors, I mean, call the doctor, the insurance won't pay for it. So they're like, all right, take this instead. So, yeah, it's just kind of like give and take between doctors and insurance as well that goes on which is insurance is obviously part of the medical industry. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, I, I wanted to give Paul a chance. Can you read it, Pauline? Yeah, absolutely. Um, he says, whenever I go to a new doctor, the idiot doctor assumes that I don't have a brain and talks to my caretaker without acknowledging me. And I would definitely say yes. And that's not just in the medical industry. <laughs> that's like yeah. restaurants and... Well, well, the next person I'll go to because of that's that. That's like everywhere. <laughs> because as an interpreter, she deals with that as well. So I'll just go to you next, Crystal. I didn't expect to talk. Usually about this time, I have to feed all the pets, but they're sleeping. So I'll, I'll hurry while they're asleep. <laughs> but um, I've had the same experience as an interpreter. People talk to me or hand me the papers or whatever, and I have to kind of remind them who their patient is. Um, I can't think of any like major glaring stories, just like a lot of doctors don't even want to pay for the interpreter to be there. They'd rather write notes back and forth and the deaf person really has to advocate for themselves. And I've been there when a doctor just said they don't, they pr provided the interpreter one time and the doctor said, I don't want to do it again. It, it cost me too much. It's <laughs> It's a cost of doing business. It's, it's not that much money. And they, they just don't understand how it's like kind of helping out someone who has obstacles all the time. If you just have an interpreter there, you're taking down a barrier. So they just don't see it. It's just money, money, money. That's all they seem to care about. Um, but there are some good doctors who just provide the interpreter, no question. But it's just like constant education i feel like sometimes like they're like oh are you here for the deaf person i'm like well i'm here because nobody else knows sign language <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I, so. you know, I feel for people who are deaf because like for us we need ramps and can you imagine if we had to bring our own ramp everywhere like i, I don't feel like it's any different um so i i do feel for people who rely on that bridge to uh. interact with the world yeah, right. Definitely. Many accommodations or something alter the physical space. But for sign language, it's like learn a whole other language or your accommodation is a whole nother human. And what is that human going to be like behavior? Are they professional? Do they even speak sign language? Well, do they sound intelligent when they're 
you know, interpreting from ASL to English? Do they make you sound stupid? You know, it's all these things that a lot, a lot goes into it. So. Yeah, definitely. How do you re redirect? Um, often just point or I'll say, you know, please look to the patient when you're, you know, sharing your information or whatever. Um, I kind of just even try to use body language. Like I don't look at them. I'll look at the deaf person, you know, just many ways to try to get it done. And some deaf people are, will advocate for themselves and say, look at me, don't look at the interpreter, you know, so it's just, you get the whole range of, of types of individuals I work with. So. Okay, thank you. Don't they have a video relay service? I'm sorry. There I, is, didn't, I, I didn't understand what Denise said. What is she? You were asking about oh. a relay service? Yeah, she was. Yeah. There is, yeah. Um, there is like video relay interpreting, um, which there's kind of two types. I don't know how detailed you want me to go into it. One is free to all deaf individuals because we pay for a little bit on our phone bills, video relay service. And then video relay interpreting is something that you would see in a private office, um, which the, on a screen, yeah. the doctor would be paying for that still. You know, it's not the deaf person's responsibility. But VRI, video relay interpreting, is recommended anywhere except in the medical field. But I see it more in the medical field than anywhere else. So it's really backwards because the medical field is where you have patients, you know, lying down, maybe unconscious, all these different things where a live interpreter would be necessary. And then in any other setting, you know, social services, education, most people are upright and coherent, so they have the ability to look at a screen and see the interpreter. So it's just backwards. Why is it discouraged? Um, just because of when you're in a medical setting, you know, you're, you're not just sitting upright in a chair, like you're maybe sick or in pain, and it's gonna be really hard to see an interpreter on a tiny screen. Whereas if the live interpreter were there, you have a little bit more leeway and just it, more freedom. Could it be because uh, of confidentiality too? That could be it. Mm, I don't know if it's confidentiality. I just think it's medical, um, it's heavy stuff. It's gonna impact your health and your mind and your right. life. Whereas maybe an education class, you know, not as detrimental, but we're doing it backwards. Right. We have VRI and medical and not anywhere else. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we, we have a code of professional conduct to remain confidential, but we're only like governing ourselves. So there's really not any kind of, you know, big trouble, you could get your certification taken away, but some states still hire people without that. So yeah. it is kind of the Wild West a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Crystal, Ooh. for sharing your perspective. Certainly, thank you for having me. Yeah. And thank you, yeah. I get to see you at last. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Priya, um, Paul put in the chat, he said, and when I was a kid, some doctors didn't want me as a patient if they couldn't cure my CP. And that's the other thing, yeah. right? Like they, they see disability as something you need to cure or overcome or. I've had experience, I'm sure other people on this chat, like if you, like for instance, with my neuropathy specialist, the doctor gave me some medication, baclofen, which is actually a common medication for spasticity. And it didn't really work for me. So I, just said, I don't want to take this medication. And then I've had a doctor be like, you know, later be like, well, since you didn't want to take the medication I gave you, I'm like, I would have taken it if it worked, but it didn't. So figure something else out, buddy. But yeah, so doctors tend to do things like that, unfortunately. So I guess I'll go to the next person. 
Gina, do you, I mean, you're the next in line. Do you have anything to add to this conversation? Gina? You're muted too still. There you go. Hi. Yes. Um, just that, you know, coming from an able-bodied individual and not um, growing up with a lot of people in my life that I mean, it hasn't been until um, I experienced my, my stepdad had Parkinson's for those of you who I'm just meeting. And so that was, um, you know, in terms of a, a close family member um, and, and witnessing him going through that devastating disease inspired me to um, just look further into disability and access and, you know, start a company around that. And so um, I, it, it, I'm constantly cha challenging myself against my own preconceived, um, you know, I guess, biases, for lack of better words, and um, and just trying to be so sensitive and understanding to that. And I was actually, I was married to a doctor, and and so the perspective that I can bring to this is get second opinions and move on because there's a level of, as you guys have said, stubbornness and just misunderstanding and, and lack of, um, you, you know, if they don't know, there's some ego involved that they don't necessarily want to admit to that. And so um, I highly recommend like Vic getting a, a second, third, fourth, just keep going to the special, you know, you know, the research that's involved for your own advocacy is, is tremendous. And, you know, you're going to school right now. And I just, I can't imagine the amount of pressure that you're under. And so I really feel for you because obviously you are your best advocate. Um, for those of you who I keep hearing, you know, with wonderful, amazing parents that have been so supportive, but, um, you gotta, you gotta find, there are doctors out there that are going to understand and be able to kind of connect some of those dots, but those specialists are just so hard to find, right? And thankfully we do have the internet so you can keep searching, but um, yeah, I, I definitely would just move on to somebody. And, and Priya, I mean, knowing that you haven't been able to come up with some sort of, um, solution, um, I, I would not just resolve yourself to living in pain. I think that like I just discovered um, a company that does neuromuscle stimulation. Um, and part of that is because it, it does alleviate chronic pain. Um, but then there's also a rejuvenating part of that. So our chief innovation officer lives um, independently with quadriplegia. And he's so um, excited that he found this company that um, he wears a it's a wearable therapy is what they call it so it's a non-farm muscle stimulator and he's actually has like defined biceps now and so it's helped him with his pain and now he's actually on a path to um, you know having some definition he's a he's 30, 31, you know, so he still wants to look his best. And, and so I, I definitely think that that's why these groups are so important. Um, I've been conducting some interviews for the past few months, trying to identify new technology that's out there so we can share it. And that's why I joined this group. So I definitely um, encourage you yeah, to keep searching and finding somebody that, I mean, obviously if you've been tested in positive for lupus, that that's just insane that these doctors, but if you go to an ER, happened to be married, was married to an ER doc. And the great thing about ER docs is that they are trained in every different type of um, ailment, right? Because they have to recognize it when people first come into the ER, but they're not specialists. And so I'm not surprised to hear them saying like, oh, you have, you know, a headache. It, it, it's just, it's crazy. So, um, I wish I could recommend a specialist for you, but I don't know any, but 
I will now, now that I know that that's, that's out there, I will keep my ears open. But the um, neuromuscle stimulation, I'm happy to talk offline if you guys want. I'll put my email in there. But James, if it, were, if it weren't for James, he just said that he wishes he would have started it immediately during, after his accident. Um, he waited for two years and then there was atrophy that set in. And so now, you know, he's on a better path. And the, the fact that it alleviates a lot of the chronic pain is just remarkable. So I'm, not, I'm surprised more people aren't aware of that therapy. So um, Gina, could you put the name of that company in the chat? And and yeah. she made a point. She said she, she tried some variations of wearable technology and didn't do much for her pain. Um, and and the doctors blamed her for that. So now I, get the, I guess it's like a it's an experiment with our own bodies, right? Like, I think I might have put in, put in that it's like they want to experiment, like, but we have to experiment with, with our bodies and what works and what doesn't work. Um, and I do, and she not a neuromuscular TENS machine, just a regular TENS machine, but I mean, TENS. Oh, it's, it's just a stimulation of some sort. But yeah, I'll talk to you. I have your email, Gina, so I'll write you about that. Yeah, yeah, it's different because the tens, um, because of the stickiness, part of the problem with the tens is that adhesive wears off. Whereas because this is a wearable, it's like an actual neoprene sleeve or wherever you're experiencing your pain, you know, they have back, um, you know, they, it's, it's custom made. And so they literally put these stimulators specifically on your muscles so that um, and you can wear it. You can wear it while you sleep. Um, I, I'm I'm pretty blown away by the technology myself. So yeah, that's the thing. I definitely want to learn more about that. Okay. So, yeah, let's follow up. I have to follow up with you on some other things too. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so Chris, we'll go to you next. Did okay. You okay. Any? Real quick. Sorry, Paul. Put oh, in the chat. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Priya. <laughs> Um, Paul says, lately I've discovered topical CBD oil for my joints. Non-traditional treatments work for many people. Yes. Yeah. Um, that was something my husband, my husband got this parasite called rat longworm. Um, it's in tropical areas. It's in here in Hawaii. And what's unique about this uh, parasite is that it goes into your brain, it goes through your spinal fluid and into your brain and causes meningitis, which caused brain damage. Um, and it kind of turned into this like an autoimmune disorder where it's kind of like MS. He'll cycle, has his high, high times, and then it'll go back down. And we went to a doctor in Mexico. We saw this Eastern medicine doctor in Oahu. And only because of them, the other, you know, traditional Western medicine was steroids, which was needed for the, for the immediate swelling of the brain. But after that, in terms of quality of life, it was the alternative doctors that really made a difference. Um, and yeah, so I would highly suggest, but something he started taking because of what the doctor in um, Oahu said, the Eastern medicine doctor, she, he suggested a supplement called MitoQ. It's like CoQ10, but it's negatively charged, which is what helps rebuild your cells. So um, I don't know. I'll put, I'll put the name. I don't, I didn't research a lot of it. He did. Um, and so I'll put the name in the chat. So. And yeah, I'll just speak like a lot of natural, like acupuncture, Chinese medicine and massage therapy. Those are kind of things that I turn to like massage therapy and acupuncture, not so much, but Chinese medicine. Sometimes I'll drink something, drink something. And it always tastes like mud, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, and then Vic, Vic put in the chat, um, collagen supplements and magnesium are two other non-traditional treatments that have been helping her with pain management and arthritis, lupus. Um, yeah, magnesium, calcium mag that calms is, is really, it's good for spasticity. It loosens up things. My doctor gives me, tells me to take like all sorts of supplements of like vitamin D, calcium, um, and whatnot. And that's supposed to like it, I guess it helps. I don't personally like see a difference, but like taking the magnesium and collagen, like I've seen, I've felt like the difference in when I take it versus when I don't, but like they're all supposed to be good supplements for like, if you're having like chronic joint pain, it's supposed to help like combat the, um, inflammation in your joints and also like relieve the pain. Yeah. Careful with the, um, 
um, calcium because a lot of doctors push that. And then you get calcium depo deposits in your joints, which makes your pain worse. Yeah. Yep. So that's a yep. That happened to me as a kid because I wasn't produced. I wasn't able to like produce calcium on my own. So I had to go on so many supplements. And then my junior year of uh, high school, I had to have minor knee surgeries in both knees to like clear out the calcium deposits. I was like, wow, this is great. <laughs> have you turmeric, Vic? Uh, turmeric? I don't know. People tell me to take turmeric. I have tried it, but my doctor told me no, because apparently it can trigger my lupus. That she says uh, I don't have, but then tells me not to take things <laughs> that trigger my lupus. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Okay. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> oh, can I go to Chris then? <laughs> Okay, well, I'm a polio survivor from way back. I'm almost 70. So I've seen a lot of doctors and a lot of medical places. I think what I've learned is there are, there are a few A-plus doctors. And when you find one, you don't want to give them up. <laughs> and I use it, the qualities I find in those kind of doctors is they're knowledgeable, but they're also conversational. They listen to you. They consult with you. And when you come back a second and third time, they know you. It's not like you're starting all over again. So, so, yeah. so you, ha you have a relationship with the doctor. They're hard to find because in, a, in the medical profession, I think a lot of the professionals, especially doctors, they kind of tend to be know-it-alls and they're not too good at listening. So recently I've had more luck with the nurse practitioners because they do have that conversational listening style and they always consult with the doctor and, and then, then you deal with them. Uh, most recently, one of the, small problem I had was I was in Grand Junction and I went to a nurse practitioner for some itchiness I've had at night when I tried to sleep and she prescribed me a, a non a, a, a medication that stops itching without side effects and it was working so when I moved down here to Mesa I wanted to get the new I wanted to uh, get a new supply of the medication and my nurse practitioner here said Hmm, studies say that that leads to dementia. <laughs> so I'm starting to wonder why I couldn't wow. remember my name, right? So yeah, it's it, and, and I do think that getting the second and third opinions is really important. But most of the doctors I think are fairly good that I've had success with, but there's only a few that I would say would rate A plus, and it's because they're knowledgeable, they have a relationship with you, you can trust them, they see you as a person, uh, and, and not just another uh, addition to their income. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Chris. Um, so, Oji, do you have anything to share with us? I've uh, been dealing with my degenerative condition that didn't get properly diagnosed. It's been for 15 years. It didn't get properly diagnosed till nine months ago, even though I tested positive for it back in 2012 and in 2017, the doctors I had at that time um, just didn't bring it to my attention or they didn't notice it or didn't think it was important. But it turns out that all this time I had undiagnosed chronic Lyme disease on top of everything else. So um, I was just, just to, I wanted, I kind of made some notes because my 15 year odyssey, if, um, I did a video for Pauline. If you really mm -hmm. want to know my story <laughs> in, in a more condensed form, I did for her shaped uh, by disability um, okay. and about becoming a wheelchair user, um, which, which by the way was so good. It was so good. You guys check it out. <laughs> um, it's on my Instagram. I'm sorry. Where do we find that? Um, I have it on Instagram and YouTube. I can post the YouTube, but if you can find me, I'm mostly on Instagram. It's mostly the only thing I do. Um, and it's OG, OJI, and then I'll put my last name uh, for Instagram. Um, but I had a doctor at the very beginning. Uh, his name was Dr. Foster. He was so wonderful. And since he was my first doctor, I thought all doctors will be like this. But then he had to retire at 89, the wussy and so it's kind of really come on you're only 89 um and so i've gone through lots and lots of doctors with lots of ableism i had doctors uh that said i will treat you for anything but your disability so like if i get the flu 
or something like that, they'll treat me, but they would not in any shape, way, or form deal with my disability. Um, or I more tests and more treatments. Um, 90% failed, mostly probably because they didn't know what they were dealing with. And then I would get blamed for not responding to their treatment, labeled non-compliant, uh, which now I wear as a badge. Mm -hmm. um, but they would always want to do the same test over and over again. And for the first 10 years, I just let them. And the medical bills that piled up and right. now the medically induced PTSD that I have because of it, because they don't care how much it hurts. They don't care how, what kind of side effects you get sent home with. Um, and the thing that is, I think the most ableist is that the one medication that actually helps my pain of now, of course, is the big bad boogeyman of the medical world. And even though I've had the last eight doctors say, this is exactly what you should be on. None of them want to be the ones to just prescribe it. So when I went through my Josh surgery. Is it because it's an opiate? Yes. Go ahead. And so when I went through my jaw surgery, I'm allowed um, one dose of medication for every three days. And I've been on that regime for years. But when I went through the surgery, um, cause they had to like cut open my, and stitches under my tongue and it's very graphic, but they both agreed I should have additional pain medication, but neither one of them wanted to be the one to prescribe it. Mm -hmm. So now I'm in a two month, no pain medication whatsoever for the next two months. I'm not mm. sleeping. I can't get out of bed. And they're like, well, that's horrible. See you in the end of October. Um, and it's just that. Um, that the thing that they say it we've been saying about doctors is that they either want to have a prize for curing you or they're terrified you're going to become what I've been called, which is MMI medically, maximum medically improved. <laughs> if you're maximally medically improved and they can't improve you, they don't want to maintain you. And so that's been my fight because I kept telling them I had. Lyme disease. I know I got bit by a tick and the, this is how big the thing was. Yeah. And they just, oh, you know, you, you know, nothing you're silly. And only about a year ago, because of my great oncologist, um, got me in a diagnostic team. And I knew I was in the right place when I came, to, you know, when you come in with your medical um, files, you know, mm -hmm. you bring your and yeah. And I'm stunned that he's actually gone through 15 years of medical records and read them. So I knew this is the guy I need to be with. And even and even they they tell me how under medicated they I am, but they are fighting their own insurance company because no matter how little they prescribe me of my medication, they get shit for it. So when your doctor says this is what you should be on, because I've tried it all, everything in this list, Eastern, Western, I've been in sweat lodges and healing circles and turned upside down and shook and you name it. I've done it all. And I did because if you didn't, you were non-compliant. Mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's that, that's the, the, the mindset of so many doctors is that they, I, I know doctors and we're like jokes to them, you know, oh, they just want the good drugs. Oh, they know all the code words to get them. And during my dental surgery, they try to pawn me off on tramadol. I told them tramadol makes me throw up. They said, well, try it anyway. And so I took the tramadol and then threw up and tore all the stitches out of my, out of my mouth. And then they said, oh, tramadol makes you sick. Oh, oh, why didn't you say? <laughs> so I joke about it um, because I. <laughs> well, 
Well, but, we all talk about it because if we get angry, then we'd be angry all the time. <laughs> and of course, no offense to the men in the group, but as you know, we, uh, men have pain and women are emotional. <laughs> yes, we all know that one. <laughs> so that's, that's one of the reasons I wanted to come, I guess, to just uh, be with people who get that because when I tell people why I, my schedule is so slowed down, um, they just, well, you know, you know, get over, oh, it's just pain, you know, put, strap on a TENS machine or, you know, take some Tylenol or, you know, take a hot bath. And some degenerative conditions just, that. and so it's just, it's hard right now to try to, figure out a way to deal and go on with my world, which I'm very big on, when basically they're all just terrified of the medications. So that's my story. But still, I'll put the other. I, I'm so much more articulate on the video. <laughs> no, that was great, OG. That was very articulate. I know maybe, I feel like that too when I'm talking like, oh my God, I'm babbling all this stuff and no one. So, um, but yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. I, I really think it was important for all of us, you know, people that haven't had to deal with, like Vic and OG had, you know, that haven't had to deal with ableism in the medical industry, like hearing these stories, I think are, it's like really, really important. So thanks so much for sharing that. And yes, I totally get it, by the way. So thank you for coming. Um, well, and, go and, oh, go ahead. well, and I just wanted to say, like, this is what's the beauty of this kind of group is that you don't feel like, oh, it's just me or it's in my head mm -hmm. or it's just my I'm alone in this experience. And so, um, yeah, it's true, because I think since I mean, I we talked about this last week with Hector, who was going to, I was going to call him next, but so I'll just transition into Hector. Like we were talking about why the disabled community isn't as organized as it should be for their rights. And I, I was like saying, I think it's cause you know, there's no neighborhood where all the disabled people live. And you know, like, so like if you're a race, races usually are living in the same neighborhood. So disabled people are just spread out. And so, and then a lot of people focus on what their disability is and not necessarily the entire community. So, um, so yeah, I think it's great to have a group like this so we can hear each other's experiences and be like, oh good, I'm not the only person that's dealing with something like this. I'm not crazy or whatever. I did see Paul wrote something, Pauline. So if you wanna maybe read that and then we'll, we can go to Hector after that. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, all right, it's not going up. Oh, sorry, one second. Um, so he said that um, up until 2010, I was taking a name brand seizure med and it worked great. However, in 2011, Medicaid would only pay for the generic. So after two weeks of being on the generic, he, I had a series of seizures and landed in the hospital. And I didn't know, I was actually going to respond to him in the text, but since I'm talking now, um, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't even know that generic was that different from, like, I, 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 I also didn't realize I had to take generic. Medicine, medicine for, and for anxiety, for anxiety, for anxiety. For anxiety. Nicole, are you um, um, are you you were saying something about anxiety? I didn't catch the first part. Yes, I, I take medication for anxiety, and it's various. I've been fighting Medicaid for, to pay for my medication, and it's, it's been very hectic. Wow. Well, thank you for coming on here because. You know, coming out on a group and sharing is not easy either. But so, thank you for sharing that. Yes. Thanks for call. I'll call on you after I call on Hector because I do want to hear from you, Nicole, and we'll talk about that a little more. So, go ahead, Hector, and ex you know, talk about your experiences. And Hector also, I believe, is on the board of the Center for Independent Living where he lives. So, 
I'm guessing you probably meet a lot of people with disabilities because of that. I do. And by the way, Priya, you do a good me. All right. So that's, that's awesome to know. Um, and the reason that I, I came back today is because what I love about this group is just the, the information and knowledge. And I mean, I haven't stopped talking to you guys ever since I was on last week. So I, I love the fact that we even have another, you know, source to be able to stay in touch. So that's, that's all good. Uh, being a quadriplegic for, for 38 years, uh, I think I learned on early on that, um, that either I had to advocate for myself or I just had to be that teacher to my doctors, which kind of scared the shit out of me, you know, that I would have to know more about my body and then I would have to then educate them on what spinal cord injury is all about and stuff like that. So um, for today, I mean, I, I like where I'm at today. I think I have more struggle with trying to explain things to my insurance company than I do to my doctors, you know, only because I've had to put a team together because, you know, I've, I've heard about, you know, you know, my MD doesn't know it all, you know, even though it's like general medicine, he doesn't know it all. So I, I do, I end up having to deal with a urologist and a physiatrist and, you know, an MD and, and all this other stuff. And then I got to make sure that they're all talking to each other, you know, and explaining things to each other because, you know, one will give me a medication that I'm allergic to or, or do this or that, or I'm not, you know, I'm not, you know, there a lot of percent. And I'm, I'm going through the aging process as well, too, with my injury, you know, so and that's the thing that, and that's why I say, I think I'm, I'm having to advocate more for myself with my insurance company, because my insurance company, which I'm very grateful for, the fact that they've been insuring me for the past 38 years from the one injury, only because I was grandfathered caused in when insurance changed, uh, you know, back in 1990, when they put a cap on it. Um, so I'm constantly having to educate them because they, they, they believe they well, Mr. Guy, we're only here to cover for your injury, your spinal cord injury. So when you get a respiratory infection, we don't see how that relates to your spinal cord. Injury. Well, you know, then I have to educate them that because I am a spinal cord injured person, it does affect my breathing, it affects my lungs. You know, it's pretty, being a quad pretty much affects all your other internal, you know, stuff, lungs, hearts, and all that other stuff. So I'm constantly having to, to educate that. So I think I've accepted myself in that role although it really gets tiring to be at times. It's frustrating at times. You know, for a guy 55 years old, yeah, dude, I still cry tears about how frustrated and how angry I get with just nobody getting it, or at least I feel like nobody gets it, you know? So I just, I just have to continue to just move forward and, um, and lucky to feel like right now I do feel like I'm stable because I have a good network. And I, you know, and I took part in being, you know, putting that network together. So it's, it's about educating yourselves, about educating yourselves about what your doctors think they know, you know, because you have to know that information too, you know? So I'm just here to say that I'm learning so much, you know, I'm learning so much from this, this group and I'm learning so much more about asking questions, you know, instead of me assuming that I know what I think I need to know for myself, I just yeah. started, you know, ask questions. Well, yeah, I always tell people we're learning and growing at the same time. So, you know, that's pretty much sums it up. <laughs> um, and, and Hector, you make a, you like, um, so for those of you who aren't already, we have a Facebook group and we also have like a little chat. So if anyone wants to be added to that, maybe just PM me um, and let me know. It's just a Facebook messenger chat, but Hector, you also, just in the short term time you've been part of this group, you've asked some really good questions to help me reflect too. So thank you for that. Yeah, yeah Hector's all in that, that group chat. He's like, what do you guys think of it? It starts these conversations, which is great. I, I love that. Um, uh, yeah, like, you know, being your own advocate. Like I did a facilitate a talk a while ago, like a month ago or two months ago about how to be your own advocate. And I, and I think I talked about the medical industry a little, but yeah, I mean, we have to kind of be an advocate everywhere, not just like in the world, but in the medical world too, because yeah, doctors and building a good team, you know, your general care, your general practitioner and your neurologist and all these doctors have to be on the same page. And I'm really lucky because my doctor, I, I, at this point, I'm only just seeing a neurologist and a general uh, practitioner, and they're very good at keeping in touch. So I feel very fortunate for that. Um, 
So, well, Nicole, let's do you, you want to have, do you have anything you want to share? Yes. Okay, cool. A lot of these doctors out here have been telling my I'm adopted, and a lot of times people, a lot of doctors think uh, I've been on so many medications for different uh, anxiety medications and different medications because uh, they thought when I they thought I wouldn't be able to talk and do anything, and all the doctors were telling my parents that I wouldn't be where I'm at today with my life and everything. They, they told my mom I wouldn't be talking, I wouldn't be walking. And and I prove all these doctors wrong. And to this day, it's very hard. And the, the insurance world, I have, my mom, who is my guardian, has to go fight Medicaid, has to go through a hearing process because Medicaid is not doing what they're supposed to be doing. With, when it comes to my medication for my anxiety and all this stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's like another thing people don't really realize is that Medicare and Medicaid work together to pay for your medications and your wheelchairs and all these different things. And Medicaid's different in every state. Like some states, like uh, for me, uh, when I was living in California, they actually paid Robert for 90 hours of uh, caregiving work. The state of California paid for that. But in North Carolina, Medicaid I live in, I live in Ohio where it's, uh, I live in Cincinnati. And um, well, for me to even go to, for me to be working, it's, it's, I try to go to work with a happy, like it's very hard to go to work. And then I'm the only one in my job who had the disability and nobody gets me at my job or no one gets me. Mm -hmm. They think everybody thinks on, everybody thinks in our society, they were a joke. The president is trying to cut Medicaid and trying to cut social security. If he does that, I I, I don't know what I'm going to do. If he, if, if, if Donald Trump takes that Medicaid away from us, he doesn't understand what we all go through. We all have a disability, and if you take once you take that thing, one thing away from us, we're not going to have all that stuff. Yeah, no, right. And yeah, it's so important for Medicaid to, you know, like for people to understand how we, as a disabled community, really depend on these two ass facets. Yeah. Uh, that gets me to go to work. That gets me to live where I, I live in a group home. I had a waiver. People don't think that Medicaid, we get a waiver because through Medicaid so we can have a normal life. People right. don't. Yeah, people that aren't disabled don't really understand. I have had to explain it to a lot of my non-disabled friends about, like, like, you see, Medicaid <laughs> Well, it's not just for medicine, it's for our services out here yeah. For, yeah. for us to live. People yeah, don't it's for medicine, it's for caregiving, it's for uh, transportation, for all these different things that we depend on as a community. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, does anyone have any, I mean, that's a really heavy subject, so I don't want to be like, okay, next. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know, does anyone have questions or want to talk about that a little more? So, or does yeah, I guess, I guess the call. Does anybody have questions for me if they yeah. want more? It's like Hector has something to say. Yeah. So, so, Nicole, I just wanted to ask you, so are you tied in to any other additional service like a CIL or anything like that that could help you with some of this stuff? Especially uh -huh. if you do feel like you're being discriminated at work or anything like that. I mean, do you have anybody that can advocate for you? My mom, but she lives in Springfield, so it's really hard for she's my she she can't really advocate for me as much. But I live in a group home where I have a manager, but it's very hard for, for them to talk to them about certain things when it comes to things like this. Because like I really don't have a lot of support. My family they 
they don't really understand what it's like that they have somewhat of disability, but it, they don't have a disability where they have to have services like myself. Okay, so are you familiar where your nearest CIL is? Um, no, I, I do not know. I, I don't know what that means. Okay, Center for Independent Living. And like I said, I could probably help you out with that. You know, just connect with me either on Messenger or on Facebook, and I can try to help you get through that. All right. Yeah, so for here, the Center for Independent Living is a really great resource. Um, it's, you know, like the first one was in Berkeley. So it's like they, they advocate for people with disabilities and all, all kinds of things, not just medical, but jobs, computers, if you need a computer. And, um, and I do worry about the Center for Independent Living here did not like every second Friday and I, I'm worried about my disabled friends over there because they, they all looked for, you know, they were all, they were just like, this is the, that was the event they looked forward to so much every month. So I'm a little worried about those people since thinking about them, like what they're doing in the middle of this, you know. Yeah, especially with a pandemic, people think <laughs> with this pandemic, I like I've been having a very rough time with all this and I'm just now taking medication again for my anxiety because of this pandemic and it's just hard it's been a very hard year for me going through this stuff and it's very hard for me to talk to anybody because nobody well, knows like they have not, anxiety you are not alone there you know we're all here um yeah. And yeah, I know this has been a hard year for all of us, right, right? It's like so many crazy things have been going on. And, you know, a quarantine and a pandemic is very hard on a mental condition. In breaking right. So, and I, I, go ahead, Imani. And I, I personally struggled with having to transition from a normal routine, a routine that I used to do every day and then having to change. So that was difficult, you know? But well, I also think our routines are how we cope and manage our disabilities. So, like right. all of a sudden, like this happens, you're like, "Oh wait, okay." I like for me, going to the gym was like so therapeutic. And then when the gym closed, I was like, "No!" But I gave myself a day of being really upset. And I was like, "Okay, get up to get up." So but I, I think. For me, since I transitioned into a community job, I have no friends that I once had because I had friends who had this really at my other job, but they all left me behind because I transitioned into the, the the community world, job world, and now I have no friends. Oh man, I'm really sorry to hear that. Um... Well, you have us on Saturday. We're your <laughs> friends here. I mean, definitely going to be here, Nicole, I can tell you. But also maybe is, is there a way to keep in touch with some of those people, your your older friends from another job, like through Facebook and stuff like that? Or, or, not, or, you know? not, not well, really. You not got really. friends here now, so <laughs> whatever. Move on past that. You got some new. Here, so welcome to this group. I'm really glad you joined. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Does anyone have anything else they want to add? Um, I, I mean, Hector and I were talking about it before about COVID-19. I feel like in this moment, like a lot of people in the entire world are kind of feeling what disabled people go through on an everyday, every day right? Like not knowing what's going to happen, not being able to talk to people and connect. So, you know, my, I, one thing I want to bring up is I'm like really hoping and wishing and, you know, just hoping that after this pandemic is over, which it will happen eventually, um, that our communities remember that and like, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, a little bit of what's going on with the medical services, um, uh, you know, Zoom meetings and things like that, you know, like people working from home. 
which I think would be a great thing for the disabled community. By the yeah, way. Uh, working from home. But my concern is a lot of people are working from home now, but my concern is once the pandemic stops, are those opportunities going to lessen? Well, well that's, I think that's what I'm asking. Like right. when the pandemic is over, are these big, you know, like I have a friend that works for Nike and he's been working from home and I'm like, and he, he, he's a web developer and he always had this like privilege of working from home at his other jobs, but Nike's, you know, a huge corporation. So like, no, you right. gotta come. So he was like, kind of like, to go into work. So well, maybe, you, so yeah, I'm like hoping like places like Amazon, Nike, and like these big corporate places that force people to go into work. I mean, of course, Amazon is making people work during the pandemic. <laughs> Yeah. Like that. I, that you and know, I have both to come in. I work for I work for a corporate restaurant called Panera, and I really don't want to come in during a pandemic. But I don't have a joint book to come in. Yeah, yeah. You work for like Panera Bread, is that what? Yes. Uh, yes. So are they opening the restaurants? That's a are great job. Yeah. What is my son? My son works for Panera too. I just ate at Panera today. <laughs> when I was in college, they gave me free bread. <laughs> nice. Uh, yes, yeah, so, you know, like you know what I'm. I'm hoping that these things, like the working from home, the telemedical stuff, like the you it know, continues. like doctors are like concerned about money. So are they gonna be okay with the cost of keeping this telemedical stuff and, you know, to the, because it will really help the disabled community. And I, and I don't think we should just wait for, you know, to hope. I don't think we should sit around hoping. I think as advocates, we need to really push it, especially in it being an election year. We really do need to push it. We just say, hey, you, you know, it was one thing for the government to take care of 56 million people with disabilities. You know, now they're taking care of almost a whole country now, which is yeah, considered yeah. with a disability, a, a medical issue, a severe medical issue. So, so uh, <laughs> you know, I, I like to believe that, you know, that there's opportunities here despite, the, despite this uh, pandemic, but there are, there are opportunities to make this a better world, seriously. Not, not better again, but just a better world, you know? So. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Well, well, all right, guys, we're at the 1230 mark. Um, Holly, um, thank you. Can yeah. the people who didn't go, um, go next week? Oh, Denise didn't get to go. Oh, yeah, there's like so many it's people. Ready. I didn't get to everyone. I was like, I don't know if this is going to end by 630. There's so many people here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. So we missed Denise and we missed Freddie. Um, Really glad there's so many people here but I was just like okay because this is such a hot topic so it's hard to not go on and on about it. so I, I don't really Can we go I want everybody to speak as much as they want to about it you know so yeah yeah um yeah we can um we can carry this conversation over to next week um and then I, well, I also wanted to, we can bleed it into another conversation. Uh, I don't, but I'd love to have, what do you guys think about the topic about inspiration porn? I'd love to hear everybody. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Especially <laughs> with Chadwick Boseman. Oh, go ahead, OG. Yeah, oh, yeah. Saying, uh, I'm a disabled dancer in a physically integrated oh. company cool. uh, here in Atlanta, Full Radius Dance. Check us out. And... Oh. We get so much, oh, you're big dancers. And so they think that the able bodied people push us and we do hand things. And we <laughs> do flips, and I can balance on my foot plate with no wheels on the ground. And yeah, ch ch check out my Instagram. I put it on the thing. Cool. But oh, cool. yeah, oh, Insta oh, I'm right there, baby. Oh, cool. <laughs> I'd love that subject. <laughs> okay. All right, perfect. especially with Chadwick Boseman like just dying yesterday, the amount of inspiration porn that oh is my God. out of this. Like, yes, we all know he's just an amazing badass for making all those movies and also having uh, colon cancer. But like, can we stop this inspiration porn and like ableist comments about this man's death? Like, it's just oh. Ugh. Yeah. And same OG. I'm a huh. um, disabled huh. athlete, like soccer, MMA, dancing, bodybuilding for a little bit, and like. The amount of like 
inspiration porn that came out of that of like oh my god this disabled girl can like dance and I'm like yeah like my body works it's just like it doesn't like to work it doesn't want to participate but like I can still do it and like someone I've had so many just like horrible comments said to me in an athletic setting of like oh my god you only got that because you're disabled like you're totally our like inspiration porn and it was oh my god I could go on on that topic I I, I have a sign someone made for me that says not your inspiration okay and I just tell that Uh, are you looking for inspiration yeah wrong place next door (laughs) I totally just followed you on Insta, OG, and like, I'm kind of creeping, so like, don't mind me if I accidentally oh, no, like, like old posts. <laughs> um, I think we, I, I, I have a topic we could bring up in this group that nobody knows. Maybe how to protect ourselves in the dating world. Okay. With a date. That could be a good topic. Okay. Yeah, how, yeah. We're, how we're dealing with the pandemic, how we're staying safe when we have to go outside. Yeah, well, she was saying, I think, Nicola, we were saying dating, protecting yourself in the dating world. With a yeah. disability. With a disability. Yeah, so yeah. we actually did two, um, two, I, part one and part I, two. I, I didn't get to hear that because I. Yeah, no, it's totally fine. And you're welcome. I like, that I last week. Yeah, on my, on your YouTube, on my YouTube channel, you can definitely go back and um, listen to past uh, talks that we've had. They are long because they go over often. Uh, <laughs> even though I try to be like, all right, guys, we gotta go. Uh, I, to talk. I know it is, uh, and I have like my son and and husband, and I need to get to. But um, but at the same time, we didn't talk about protecting yourself and how there is a higher rate of sexual assaults on people with disabilities. Um, and on media too. I was just telling Tylea, Indian. Middle Eastern men and African men are always asking to be my friend. Then sometimes they're like friends with you, Pauline, or <laughs> yes. and, I'm like, hey. and then they're like, "Hi, send me a picture of yourself." I'm like, "All right, chair chasers." Yes, the <laughs> devotees, chair chasers, love that term. Good. Okay, good. So we'll definitely put that on the on the list of things to talk about in future chats. I love this. So and yeah. If yeah. So, Colleen, I don't want to, like, I know you got to get to your husband and son. Um, I just want to say, so next week we'll start with Denise and Friday to continue the medical conversation, and then we'll, you know, melt into the inspirational porn conversation. Which will probably lead into the following week, and then bleed in. I'll bring some of my favorite examples. Okay. All right. Perfect. All right. Everyone write your story. Take notes on your story so you can share. And I'm happy to have you here. Thanks so much. Yeah. And, you know, not everyone, like, like inspiration porn. I don't know how, you know, sometimes I'm like, yeah, you're right. I am an inspiration and I own it, you know, like, so there's, you know, there's a lot of ways that different ways that people with disabilities approach it. And well, I say like for me to like get up go up a flight of stairs with my discipline like yeah that is inspirational but um Habin Giram who's like a deaf blind uh advocate who I absolutely love and she said I don't mind it when people say you're inspiration but what are they going to do to change it so you don't have to be an inspiration and I'm like yes yeah so I mean like so there's a variety of views and I Um, love this kind of forum because it allows us to come together and share the views, but. I beat you to it, to it Pauline. I beat you to it because I threw that in the, uh, in the chat. Yes. With the, uh, with the guy from the RNC. You know, I, I knew it, there was a uh, differences in what people look at and stuff like that. But I, but I just wanted to hear from this group, especially because I admire this group. See, there I go with the uh-huh. <laughs> admiration porn. Uh, uh, a guy with disability <laughs> admiring you guys. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? When you when you have greatness, when there's great people around you, why would you not want to admire them? So we'll Amen. receive that, Hector. We'll we'll all receive this, and that includes you too. So <laughs> I, I did a video um, about um, inspirational porn in the dance world. Um, that's also on YouTube. I think it might be on Instagram, um, but I'll send you a link, Pauline. Yeah. Because um, uh, yeah, Pauline, a, why don't you couple- share group and. In, on the Facebook group, you know, the, because I, I would like to really do Facebook. So no, no, that's fine. <laughs> I just oh, okay. 
I just want to see your YouTube link. That's if so, Pauline could share it because the chat it disappears, you know, so yeah, I can't. Uh, and get if it. you go to my YouTube and my profile, it has a, a thing to all of my YouTube. Uh, I just I just became friends with you on Instagram. So is the cool. YouTube there? Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you awesome. go to my profile, it'll say dance videos and it has an arrow. Uh huh. And uh um, it's got the dance videos and it's got the last three talks I did because that was part of going to dance at places. And uh, oh, cool! I'm excited. Coca Cola. It'll say the one. Uh, I think it's called Second Voice, but it's the one from Coca-Cola. And you're another Southerner, too, OG. Yay! I know. I can talk just like Ash this. If you ask me. <laughs> Some Floridians here. Virginia is probably out, too. So. Yeah, so everybody um, get up on Facebook. Uh, well, I, okay. Uh, sorry, OG. We're you know, right, no not a Facebook person, but we do have a, a pretty active group on Facebook called Crip Chat Club via Zoom. And if you signed up and got the subscribe, if you subscribe to the mailing list, you got the link to that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, but please feel free to share. I'm not one of those, we're not one of those groups where it's like, don't promote your own stuff. I'm all about promoting, like, promote your own stuff. So I, I jump on there. I have an account for business. Uh, so okay. I don't like have I don't like get on there long enough to get people's messages because people leave me messages and I don't get on there for a month and then they get mad at me. But um, I I go on for business things every once in a while, so I'll type that up and if you'll just forgive me if I don't answer very quickly. Oh no worries, no worries. It's fine. I'll just slide into your Instagram DMs, OG, and just be like, oh, Hey, I'm how's it going? <laughs> I'm, I'm on Instagram all day long. That's how I'm making my money these days. Um, I'll have to tell you. How oh, to I'm on the Instagram. Same. Like, maybe that's another discussion because Hector was like, we have a lot of work and we can monetize this career. I was like, yes, yeah, so I'm very interested. So how about how we monetize ourselves with the stuff we're doing? Yes, I that would be another topic. I, I fell into it very yeah. accidentally. I fell yeah. into Which it I really accidentally. Uh, yes, I would love to hear about that, OG, how you did that. Um, yeah, so, and I will be um, opening up a new thing uh, arm of one leg up productions called made for more to help people who are uh looking to ha have a message or they have a feel like they have a calling to like do something in terms of uh, creating a business um like creating a business that's related to their purpose and helping them jumpstart that so i feel really called i feel like oh hector's no longer here but i feel like i am surrounded by amazing people who are you're all influencers. Um, and, you know, if there's a way we can help get you out there and, and expand your impact, then I would love to help do that. So that'll be coming. I'm probably going to be launching it probably in October. So okay. keep an eye out for that. Um, all right. Uh, okay. Lovely people. Okay. Thank you that so much. Really, it's like, you know, when you're, you're bored. No, you say bye. You say I know, bye. no, you go. <laughs> you say bye. <laughs> all right. Well, great seeing all of you, and I hope a lot this week. It's funny. Yes. Just, bye, Paul. It was great seeing you. And yep. I'm going to bye. And, all right. And bye, guys. Bye. 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 bye.